So uh, let's get this party started. Uh, so my name is Micah Godbolt. Um, you'll see um, that name on slides and all over the place. Um, I am the author of Frontend Architecture for Design Systems, a uh, book by O'Reilly. Uh, you can pick up a copy there at fea.pub, frontendarchitecture. Pub, send you right to the Amazon link. Um, if you're really interested, um, tomorrow, I think at 11 ish, I need to find the time exactly for that. Um, I actually be doing a book signing at the Drupal, Con the Drupal Association booth, I think it is. Again, I need to find out where the, exactly that is. But be giving away some free copies there, signed copies. They're going to be collectible items. You might want to hold on to them. All right, uh, you can follow me on Twitter. I talk pretty much consistently and all of the time about web development. It's kind of my water cooler, uh, as well as, as I, um, I write and blog at mica.codes. Um, you'll love going there. It's going to load fast because it's pretty much just an HTML file. It's rad. All right, enjoy it, and uh, let's get on with the talk. So um, this talk is called uh, Roadrunner Rules, or more what you call guidelines of a design system. <laughs> Hopefully you know that reference. Those are going to be the only two horrible puns of the entire talk. So from here on, uh, it's going to be cute pictures of my kids. Um, I want to take a little bit of a tangent. We are going to talk about design systems. Uh, but as I kind of got this talk ready, I realized there's a lot of backstory that I really want to get people filled in with of why we're even building design systems in the first place. So let me talk to you about my daughter, because of course, every dad likes to talk to you about daughters. Uh, there's, some, there's like three, four, five seats up here. Maybe raise your hand if you got seats next to you so we can get people actually sitting if you want. Wow, look at all that. Cool. All right. So um, she is four years old, and uh, she loves flowers. We all love flowers. Um, who doesn't like flowers? Don't raise your hand. I will point you out. Um, when we go and look at flowers, um, she likes to talk to me about the flowers. Um, she'll say things like, Daddy, can I have a flower? And if I don't respond within three seconds or so, it's like, Daddy, I want a flower, kind of thing. Um, no laughs, really? Do you, do you even have kids? This is like, anyway. Um, and once you give her the flower, she's like, oh, this flower looks beautiful. And it's the cutest thing, and it melts your heart. All right, let's move over to my son. Uh, his name is Reese. He is two years old. He likes flowers, too. Slightly different way of communicating about them. When he wants a flower, uh, or no, when he sees a flower, he says, flower. When he really wants a flower and you're not giving it to him, it, within like a half a second, because he's a two-year-old, flower! That's pretty much all I can say. And then when he sees a flower and it's beautiful and he loves it, he says, flower. That is his language. That is his understanding of the language. Uh, and what I was really curious was, how are these things different? I mean, obviously, one's a two-year-old, one's a four-year-old. But if we can break this down and see uh, what, what really distinguishes the difference between my two kids and their understanding of our language? Why does one talk in single words? Why does one talk in full sentences? Um, and to do that, we can actually dive into linguistics to get a better understanding of that. Um, linguistics, if you don't know, and we'll see this, uh, this definition a couple times, is a set of structural rules governing the composition of clauses, phrases, and words in any given language. Um, that is just the Wikipedia. I should have an attribution. My apologies, Wikipedia. Um, but that is what linguistics is. Um, it helps us to understand our, our verbal languages, um, understand the rules around them that govern the composition of these clauses and phrases and words. Um, inside of linguistics, there's a couple different fields. Uh, these fields kind of research different areas and have these uh, expertise in different areas. Uh, the first one is called phonology. Phonology, phonetics, you kind of get this thing. It's, it's all about the sounds. So phonology is understanding the organization of sounds within a language. So for instance, we have this concept of onset and rhyme. Uh, in a word like beauty, uh, the first syllable is b with the onset, u as the actual rhyme. The second t, or t, sorry, for beauty, the onset is t, and the rhyme is e. So combining those different uh, phenomes together, phonemes, sorry, phonemes together. <laughs> His wife is a, a linguist, uh, so he's nodding when I get it right. <laughs> um, when combining these different phonemes together, you're actually able to create these syllables um, that we're actually speaking. So it's just the understanding of these sounds. It's nothing to do with the actual meaning of what these things mean. That comes later in the next phase of study, which is called morphology. The idea of the structure and composition of words and how do we put these sounds together uh, uh, to create actual meaning from those sounds. So let's look at the word beautiful. Uh, there's actually uh, two morphemes there. One's beauty, that is a noun. Uh, the second is full, that is a suffix that we use as an adjective to say something's full, full of. Combining those together, we get 
beautiful, which is another adjective, a more meaningful adjective than the noun or the, uh, the suffix uh, might give you. So that is morphology. That allows us to uh, create words out of all of these sounds we've described in phonology. Okay, third one, and I swear I'm going to get out past this eventually, is syntax. Syntax is the idea that we've got all these words now. These words have meaning, and that's great. But we need rules that actually govern the structure of these sentences. So let's look at this last sentence my daughter said. This flower looks beautiful. She says it pretty much daily. Um, we can break that down into an article and a noun as well as a verb and an adjective. And yes, that's an adjective, not an adverb. Took me a little bit of time to make sure that was right. So um, those two can then be um, uh, also expressed as a noun phrase, as well as a verb phrase. We can split our sentence up into those two things. And when all put together, that creates one big sentence. So we've gone all the way from the onset and rhyme, trying to explain how we create the sounds, combine those together to actually create words, and then understanding the syntax of a language and how that allows us to create sentences uh, and, uh, and even uh, paragraphs and further and further on um, uh, with those words. So what in the world does linguistics have to do with design systems? Uh, I'm sure that's a question that everyone has and I would love to answer it for you, but first, one other thing. Um, it turns out that there's not, there, there's a lot of languages out there and actually this original talk I was going to dive into uh, sign language and body language, uh, even computer languages. Um, uh, it would take way too much time, I found out so it got cut. Um, but we, what we do want to talk about is another language that's extremely important for us to talk about and that is visual language. And it turns out that visual language is just as valid of a language for us to study. And what if we were to do a study of visual language? What would we find when we study it? So the first thing um, I want to talk about is the, uh, basically what is a visual language? Um, Wikipedia again says it's a system of communication using visual elements. So system of communication, cool. Communication is a good word. Uh, IBM on their uh, design language uh, page uh, explains it as a shared vocabulary for design. So again, we're talking about vocabulary. Here's more of these like linguistic words. It's a lot of fun. So um, not just, uh, let's see, um, there's a lot of things in common between a verbal language and a visual language. Uh, for instance, they both have an extremely common goal. Uh, the goals of both languages is to communicate. Uh, specifically with a visual language, it communicates a couple things. It can, it can communicate ideas, such as trying to convince, uh, you know, authority and um, uh, uh, whether it was reliability, trust, all those good ones, as well as maybe trying to position your brand uh, within an industry as a leader in technology. So our visual language is trying to communicate this to every single viewer of our website. But it also wants to communicate intention. What am I supposed to be doing inside of this interactive web page? It's not just a visual, it's not just an image. So it, communicate an intention, like click here, this is the navigation, this is what you should be doing. Uh, in this example of this beautiful website that I happen to work on, I'm a little biased, um, you can see this entire design is leading everyone towards that one button. They want everyone to go and click that button. The background image, the text, the entire layout, everything in the visual language says click me. I'm right here. And that's what a visual language allows you to do. Inside of this chaos of an uh, uh, e-commerce site, um, <laughs> we do have a really nice visual right in the center. We have a navigation that's exposed to all the users right within context of, uh, of the actual advertisement, which was 25% off. Something to draw the user in and push them forward through the navigation and get them going through the steps towards hopefully purchasing something. So not only do they have a common goal, but they also share a lot of common traits. Uh, the first one of those of being dialects. Um, a dialect is like a regional or cultural difference between languages. Um, in, uh, in verbal languages, that's like the difference between uh, use guys and y'all and whatever else you might use for that. Um, or you people, whatever you want to use. All right, in, in, a, in a visual language, we have the exact same differences. Um, things like word length, information density, uh, power colors. You, you can see this is uh, an example of, it's a website, it's a Japanese news website called NHK World. This is our English website. You can see the use of reds, blacks, white space, very like contained different uh, pieces of content. Uh, really simple navigation up at the top. Here's the same website in Japanese. 
it's a little bit different. You see a complete different information density. You see a completely different use of colors. You have a completely different color palette. If there even is a palette, it's all over the place. Uh, word length, of course, can make a huge difference. We deal with German words all the time, and it's ridiculous what it does to a design. destroys you. So these differences, <laughs> uh, these dialects are apparent within our visual language just as they are within our verbal language. And we've got three seats up here, a couple others if you want to uh, try and find one. Otherwise, hello. All right, so another common trait is the notion of jargon. Jargon is a type of, uh, type of vocabulary specific to a group uh, or an organization, um, and that's kind of like us with Drupal. We have lots of jargony words, whether that's a node or a module or you name it, tons of jargon. We've got that within visual as well. We've got these ideas, these visual concepts that seem to all pop up, all within uh, similar, um, uh, similar websites or similar applications. Uh, one I thought of really off the, off the bat was the notion of a price quality matrix. You find this all over the place in just about any software as a service. And they all look basically the same. There are these four or five columns or three columns. One of them's bigger than the other because it's the one that you want everyone to purchase. You've got prices, you've got features. It's all laid out in one page and you click what you want and you move on forward through it. It's to the point now that if you go to a site and it doesn't have one of these, you're like, but what are my options? What are the prices? Like, I need this. This helps me understand this uh, the, uh, this type of website and this type of service. This is jargon within visual language. Click. Okay, sweet. All right, slang. And I can probably guess, bet that you know what this is going to be in visual language. Uh, in in uh, a verbal language, we use all sorts of slang all over the place. I've tried to think of good examples to give, and I just humiliate, my, humiliate myself every time I think of them. So I'm going to jump to the visual. Uh, one of them is things like carousel language. So a carousel, uh, with a carousel, we've got this language. We've got this idea of, of uh, you know, left and right arrows. When we see those, we know what to do. We click on them when you expect something to move or slide. We've got dots at the bottom of a navigation that we're like, oh, hey, there's three elements here because there's three dots. And I can click on the first one. It goes to the first element. These, this is slain in our visual language. This helps us understand uh, how to use these things. And, and these are very specific to our industry and our language and the visual language. Last one up. You've seen these before, they're everywhere. And as just as fast as they came into Vogue and were used on every single website in the entire world, they're now going out of Vogue and there's new paradigms coming in for our visual languages. So these ideas of slangs, these invented words or, or words that are words, um, ideas that are used out of context in, in something else, like a hamburger menu. It's like, where does that come from? We just use it and, and it, gains, um, uh, it gains meaning because of that. Uh, the other big thing that's common between the two is they can be broken down into smaller units. So we saw this with our, our verbal language, that we had syntax, which explained how the, the words go together. We had morphology, which explained how the, uh, uh, the sounds go together, or the, the words go together make a word, sounds to word, yes. And then we have phonology, which explains even how we just make those sounds. We break it down to the smallest piece. And we need to do the exact same thing in a visual language. Um, so the, to do this, let's dive back into our example of linguistics and figure out if, if we were to take a linguistic study of visual language, how would we do that? So first up, we're going to start with phonology again. And again, this is the organization of our sounds. So uh, if um, in a verbal language, we have all these phonemes, phonemes, right? Phenoms. I always say phenoms. I have no idea why. These phonemes, we ask ourselves, what are the phonemes of a visual language? We have things like layout white space, balance, all those things that make, give us space within our visual language. We have typography, the weights, the scales, the typefaces. How are we, describe, how are we uh, expressing this information using typography? Because there's a lot there. Like you probably haven't, well, there are. There are entire talks just on this, probably here at DrupalCon. Thirdly, iconography, whether it's actually um, part of the interface or something just ornamental. Um, the style, the usage, where do these icons show up are all part of visual language and need to be consistent. Uh, uh, fourthly, we have color, uh, whether it be uh, the palettes, tints, shades, how are you going to be using this within accessibility? The color is going to make a large impact upon uh, how your design actually looks. And if people in the back are squinting, uh, you can go to the bit.ly address at the bottom, bit.ly. Uh, road-runner-rules, and it's actually lowercase. I'm sorry, the, the font is all caps. <laughs> um, I didn't think about that. And you can download these slides if you need to see them a little bit better. Uh, and that's also the link to um, the session, so you can go and do your voting there as well. So it's at the bottom of all the slides. Sorry, 
Squirrel. All right, last thing on here, animation. <laughs> so we're not building static pages. We're not building just these displays that people look at. We're building things that people interact with. When they interact with it, with their clicking, they're moving, they're, they're changing, uh, 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 changing the order of things, they're uh, interacting with our designs. And all interaction can benefit from animation. But how do you implement the ad animation? Is it slow? Is it fast? What kind of curves are you using? Where are you using it? Where's an appropriate place to use animation? Where's a completely inappropriate place to use animation? This is all part of our visual language as we build out our design systems. So now that we've got all of our uh, phonemes figured out, I think I got it right. <laughs> It's going to be horrible. It's one of those things that once you screw it up a couple times, you can just never feel confident about it again. Um, so uh, let's talk about morphology of a visual language and what that actually means. So we can take all these phonemes and combine them back together to now start building out our words, building out our nouns, building out the verbs of our site. Because we definitely do. We have nouns. We have content. We have verbs. We have actions. So we're definitely building all these pieces out. And we're using all these phonemes. So let's take a real simple example of, uh, you know, an input um, and a submit button. First thing let's do, let's add some layout to them. Not a huge change, but a little padding, a little white space. We're good to go. It's going to get better, I guarantee. Add some typography. Uh, we've got, um, uh, you know, all uppercase on the button. We've got a different font face. Uh, we've got different font sizes. So we've got some weight. We've got some, uh, some style. This is starting to get closer to our brand. Next, we can add on our icons, iconography. These are things that help the user understand what these buttons are used for. And the crazy circle thing is like, say like a password strength indicator or something like that. Next is color. Obviously, it's now starting looking like a brand that we actually have, some consistent colors that can be used across the site. We've got good contrast, hopefully, between all of our pieces. Um, and this is something that someone can see and read and interact with easily. Lastly, animation. One more layer on top. Something to give feedback that when you're typing into this form field, you know, these, these, these rings are starting to illuminate as your password is getting stronger and stronger. Uh, submit button that uh, after you click it and after the, the, you know, your backend is doing some work, it's giving the user an idea that something's happening. Just wait a minute. We'll get back to you with some kind of response. These, uh, this is morphology of our visual language, pulling all these pieces together, creating these nouns, these verbs, creating these, these pieces of meaning that allow us to express to our users uh, what we need to express. So lastly, in this little foray into, in, uh, into linguistics is the notion of syntax. So again, syntax is the structure of our sentences. And I definitely take this past just sentences, but the structure of our paragraphs, the structure of our entire chapters and our books. How did all these things get structured together? So let's take a look at how this is going to work. We've got currently a verb and a noun on our page. Let's go ahead and put those into an actual sentence. Something that tells the user like, hey, here's a place to enter content and here's a place to submit that content. But there's more context to that than just a sentence. We've got an entire paragraph that makes up this context. So our syntax says that we, these, these input buttons, uh, inputs and these buttons go in a larger context of a header that has more additional navigation as well as logos. And this is our syntax of how these things are placed together. And that again is large part of a much larger syntax which explains how the entire pages are placed together the content inside those and how all those other phonemes and morphemes and everything get put together to create our designs and yes I have cute kids thank you very much thank you kids for good placeholders all right now this might look really familiar and I know this guy's not his head like crazy because like yeah I, I've done this before and a lot of this of us have done this before this is Brad Frost's atomic design little gif that just explains this concept so simply. But the thing is, this has only been around for, I should have done the math, how long, when was this? A couple years, it's about two, three, four years at the most. We've been studying languages for decades. We've been dissecting languages and breaking them down in the smallest pieces forever. This is not a new concept. And I know Brad will quickly say that I didn't invent anything new. I just put a good name on it and I made it in a way that people can understand it. And he made a gif. GIFs are good. That's why I made GIFs too. It totally works. So let's jump back to that definition I had of linguistics. A set of structural rules governing the composition of clauses, phrases, and words in any given natural language. Let's change that to visual language. So we take that same definition. It's not really linguistics anymore. At that point, it's a design system. 
So uh, our design systems, what we're building is actually a study of the visual language that we're creating for our website properties. First, we're understanding how these pieces are placed together. How can we create this meaning? How can we create uh, everything we need to express about our company? And then let's figure out how do we create a system that is able to define all of those rules, define how the pieces are put together, define how animation and, and fonts and colors work together to be able to express our buttons and our action and our interactions. That is what we want to do with the design systems, and that's what we need to get to to actually get to design systems. So in studying or getting pre prepared for this, I asked around, like, hey, what do people want to know about design systems? Like, what kind of questions do you have? And of course, the first question is just like, um, well, what is a design system, in your own words? Uh, and this guy's mostly trolling me because I know he knows, but it's a really great question. Uh, and it was interesting that he gave me the question on Twitter because I had a couple of responses. One, I could write an extremely lengthy Medium post. Uh, I could do like a big tweet storm of 20 tweets to explain my like, you know, manifesto on design systems. Or I could try and squeeze the whole thing into 140 characters minus his name, which sounded like a really good challenge, so I decided to go for it. So what I came up with was this. The design system is a set of rules and assets that define how to express everything a visual language needs to say. And the great thing about fitting this into a tweet is I kind of had to just dumb it down to really simple terms. I had to use short words, and, and I, I couldn't really expand on everything. And that actually allowed me to boil it down to its essence. Uh, actually, I, I tweet a lot for like promotional things and whatnot, and it's a great, great tool to get you good at your microcopy. Like under 140 characters, get all the meaning in there, find ways to say it. It's, it's a great, great le uh, learning lesson. So let's dive into this uh, definition um, and see what all these pieces mean, because there's a lot to unwrap here. That's another, um, unwrap, is that the word? That's a slang, one of those more slang, unpack. Thank you, I was close. All right, so let's talk about rules. What rules mean? One of the first things that we uh, usually introduce into the design system is our methodologies. How are we building all these pieces, all these components? And there's a few leading methodologies right now that you'll see floating around. One of them being, and this, this is a, Horrible, uh, I should have tested this because you can't see that whatsoever. All right, um, <laughs> um, so uh, OOCSS, object-oriented CSS. Um, and again, you can download these slides. Uh, the main two uh, principles of that is separation of structure and skin and separation of container and content. Uh, so just one methodology allows us to explain how we're going to build the system. Another competing one is called SMAX, Scalable and Modular Architecture for CSS. Um, and that imposes some interesting structures in um, file system and explains how uh, CSS cascades down through it. So again, what are you picking? How are you developing this thing? Uh, BEM, Block Element Modifier, is an approach for uh, how you're writing your CSS selectors, uh, using the, typically a flat CSS approach. It can often be combined with, with the two previous methodologies. But what you choose doesn't as much matter as choosing it and making sure that it's explained and described to your users so that everyone is, is using a consistent methodology. Those are, so these are some of the rules. Other rules that we run into are like rules of thumb. Like these, this is a way we do things. Something we can see and go, hey, like, we, we don't do it that way, please change it. Uh, and one of those is the single source of truth rule. The notion that everything on your page has a single source of truth, whether that is a template, whether that is CSS. So in this case, yeah, that one's a little easy to read. We've got this section with a blog feed up at the top. Um, and there's an H1 at the top. And there's also an H1 with title class inside the article. And we bring in some CSS um, that uh, targets that blog feed H1. But the problem with that blog feed H1 is it's actually hitting both of our H1s. There it is, thank you. So this no longer has a, um, oh, I'm sorry. And then we also have article.title. So this is specifically styling the title inside the article. But you see that title in the article no longer has a single source of truth. That's what I was getting to. It's getting styles from two different locations, which means that when you update one, like if you update and you only mean to change the blog feed each one, you now are affecting both of them. So then you have to go into the article title and override that change that you did and it just gets to be a mess. And these are like two CSS properties. It gets much hairier than that. Kind of on the flip side of this is the notion of a single responsibility principle. The fact that everything is built for one purpose alone. Um, there's a couple ways you can implement this. Oftentimes it's, it's kind of built with utility classes that do one thing and do extremely well. I kind of go a different direction with that in that every single class has a single use. 
There's one place it goes, one block that it goes into, and that's the only place it ever goes. So you're not using the, that, that class which has styles applied to it in other contexts. So in this case, we've got, again, this our blog feed, and we've got a headline class inside of that. We also have a footer with a headline class inside of it. That's bad news. Because when we style our headlines, great, they both look the same, our blog feed, our footer, our H2s are just wonderful. But our designer comes back and says, hey, we're changing things, and our blog feed headline actually needs to be uppercase text now. You're like, crap, well, I can't do that without also affecting that one down below. So you might write something like this, blog feed, headline, text transform, uppercase, piece of cake, I'm done, right? Except now you've broken your first rule of, uh, of, of single source of truth. So all these things are these rules that you can uh, apply to your system to make sure that things are consistent and you're building a system that's going to be able to scale. The next one, and this is a hot topic, I'm sure, is the notion of a flat CSS selector. A single selector for every single item on the page instead of what I've probably written at some point, where I've got like five different class names all strung together with like three additional elements put in there. This is no fun, because when you need to go and override that with, say, like an active class or something like that, it's even longer, and all this just to apply a new color. So instead, if we're instead not doing that, but we're just using flat selectors, we're able just to have one selector and then have another selector. We save a lot of space. We save a lot of mental strain. We don't have to worry about the placement within the DOM. These things are a lot more portable and a lot more usable. Some of our rules actually just have to do with, with asset creation, uh, not necessarily with code. So uh, you might have something in your style guide or in your design system that explains how do you create icons? What, what is the template that we're using? What is the style that we're using? Is it, is it mostly outlines? Is it lots of fills? Is it gradients? Uh, how do we build these things to create a common consistency between our design system and within our design language? It's also like photography do's and don'ts, like the different um, uh, types of color, whether it's like you know a, a light hue or a, a kind of a blue hue or the, the, the subjects of those photos. Giving information like that to your users as they're creating content is going to help create a consistent, um, a consistent look throughout your site. We also come to this concept of like these custom rules, areas where we're creating a design system, we're coming up with these really great ideas, but none of them fit into uh, these standard paradigms, these standard methodologies. And we found ourselves, when I was working on the Red Hat project, coming across, we had a pretty large list of these, um, and we were, they were mostly in my head. Uh, and that's, there's a problem with that, because with these custom rules, they really they need to be visible. They, they need to be something that's agreed upon, and they also need to be actionable. So if someone actually sees that and can say, hey, I see this documentation that says we're not doing stuff that way, here's how you should do it, that's a very valuable rule for your system. So we realized we need to get these things written down. Uh, we would need to figure out kind of how we wanted to do this. Um, and around the same time, this was a couple years ago, um, this started circling around Twitter, circulating around Twitter. Uh, and it's this concept of the Roadrunner rules, the, uh, which is where the name comes from, if you're wondering. Um, the theory goes, because it's been disputed a couple times, but I don't care, is that Chuck Jones wrote these rules, these set of rules that say things like, the Roadrunner cannot harm the coyote, except for going beep, beep. And there's no dialogue ever, ever, except for, of course, beep, beep. Now, these are the rules that he passed along to his writers and to his animators. These are the rules that they use to create a consistent universe inside of the Roadrunner universe. So these were the types of rules that I wanted to write. These are the rules that I wanted to pass off to my team so they knew the universe that we were trying to create. And these rules, to this day, have, have led us to create a very consistent set of uh, components um, and, and layouts and various other pieces. So when you're, when you're creating the system, these rules are important. They need to be something that people can find, can be actioned upon, uh, and can see and point out and keep people accountable. Just Google that. There's great ones on there. Like Roadrunner, he's got to stay on the road. Otherwise, he's not a Roadrunner. It's great. All right, so uh, our definition talked about rules, but without, with, uh, with just rules, you don't really have much for a website. That really doesn't build much. Um, you need assets. So what are these assets and how do they work? So the first asset that's obviously the most important is HTML. We need markup. Now, there's various ways that we can actually provide this markup inside of a design system. Uh, one of those is being 
just static markup. I mean, if you go to like the Bootstrap uh, design system, that's basically what it is. You go and you copy and paste and you drop in your application and you, you, you change whatever word they had in those filler into whatever you need and you hit publish and you're done. So you take that markup, you drop it in and you go. Obviously, there's some downsides to that. So if I want to go back and change my markup, I am SOL. So um, we have moved, for, fortunately, in Drupal into more of a template system. So we've got these template files. Um, this big, huge, nasty thing is coming from comments.html.twig. And as you can kind of see on this really washed out screen, um, that we've got markup, but we also have template variables, uh, variables and logic. So we can pass data into these templates, and we can render these templates different for every single set of data. And that's extremely valuable because that means now whenever we need to make a change, we don't need to have to go back and find all the markup in the body field and like go make some like regex the entire website to figure out what we need to change. We can change it in one template and go on from there. But there's still a challenge with this template because it, it, it relies on you understanding this template. It relies on you knowing the values in this template, the values that are required, the values that will break the template if you don't put them in. What is a string? What is a whatever? Um, so as a limitation of this, the, the next thing you could do is actually provide just an API to your component. Now, um, the um, Lonely Planet uh, uh, people have put together uh, what they call Rizzo's. They're, they're style guy. They take stuff from Muppets, apparently. Um, and it's this notion of every single component has an API. It's a set of inputs that need to be passed in to create an output. And there's a couple of examples right there. Here's the fun part. Is, any idea what template is on the other side of that or what markup is on the other side of that? Do we care? No. Does the output look like it should? Yes. And with an API, we start to see that the actual markup to the user is completely irrelevant. It's this API. It's giving us an interface into that design that's completely important. So we might have this interface into our design and then decide completely change the templates out. We're not even using the same templates, not even using the, 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 the values in the same way. But the API doesn't change, and we have the same output. And that's a very, very powerful, powerful place to be because it, it makes it extremely easy to learn and, and extremely flexible. All right, other types of assets, because I'm sure this is going long, um, are the idea of linked assets. So um, we are always going to need all of these, like your HTML is linking to all these assets, and somehow they need to ride along with your design system. Um, oftentimes, that just means they get placed into Git, and they're along with the project for the ride, and when that gets deployed, they're there, and life is good and golden, until you start committing CSS and hating yourself, and you're like, why can't I do something better? <laughs> All right, so if you're not doing this approach, there are a few other ways to do it. Uh, at Red Hat, we've actually completely pulled our design system out of our, our main repo, partially because, you know, the... the uh, merge requests and everything that we go through to get code into the Drupal repo is really stringent. Um, and we want to like just merge stuff in and get stuff done and move forward. So having a separate repo, we're able to do that much quicker, quicker, quicker. And, um, and then we're able to create releases to send out to our main application. And you can do that using things like Bower or NPM, package these things up and create releases that get sent out to your applications. This is really great as well when you want to send these design systems out to multiple applications. So along with those uh, linked assets, we also have lots of build assets. These are the assets that allow us to take uh, like uncompiled code, such as SAS or JavaScript modules or, or whatever we're using, as well as all the tasks that do all this work for us, whether it's deployment or linting or, or concatenation or whatever we're using. That's definitely going to be part of your design system, part of that deliverable that, that is, uh, is inside that repo. There's obviously a lot of ways to do these. Could be something simple, as simple as npm script, like npm run my thing and it's done. Um, or you could wrap it up in something a bit more complex like grunt or gulp. And, and there's a lot of things these task runners can actually do for your design system. One of them, which is extremely powerful, is, is to be able to automate how we are going to present our design system, which leads us directly into the notion of style guides. Uh, there's a lot of, most style guides are going to have some kind of task runner component that you can just automatically run your style guide uh, with a grunt or gulp or npm command. So the idea of, of a style guide um, is the notion of we want to be able to put our documentation and our rules and examples of our code all in 
inside of some living document. That's something that people can get to and read and to see basically what we've built and how we've built it. And there's a few examples of these. Uh, we all have probably have heard of KSS Node. I know there's been a lot of talks about it around here at DrupalCon. Uh, but also the idea, uh, there's another one called Living Style Guide, another one called Hologram. These are all kind of, for the most part, pretty free form. They kind of give you like a doc block at the top of your CSS to be able to put comments in and notes and link to things, and put colors. And it gives you basically space to be able to document uh, in a way that's going to be ingested and turned into something that looks a lot nicer. So whether that is uh, you know, actual code samples or color examples or font samples, here's all the different font sizes we have. But any kind of company identity, here's our logo, here's how you use our logo, here's our corporate colors, here's like examples of how we write. All that kind of stuff can be inside of that style guide. Another type of deliverable that we might um, really often produce is a pattern library. A um, couple good examples of that is a new one out at Node-based called Fractal, and of course our ever famous and ever popular Pattern Lab. The notion of these are slightly different than our style guides. Um, these aren't really just this freeform place to be able to write stuff out. They're more of a place for us to explore and experience our design system. To be able to go in and see our components, see our pieces, see, you know, what does this look like with different pieces of content inside of it? What does our page look like and how does that break down into smaller pieces? Let's explore the markup. Let's explore the pieces that are actually in that system. And these are typically generated directly from your templates. So the, the system will go in, munge all your templates, create all these interfaces for you, whereas with, uh, with uh, style guides, we usually find those as like copy and paste an example of your code in there. Though I know, I just found out KSS does a great uh, job with this and allowing you to link to an actual asset, so that's cool. Um, so that's, is, uh, that's a pattern library, super valuable for prototyping, a great deliverable to your client. But sometimes you just gotta, you know, roll your own. Uh, and then we can see that with uh, uh, Salesforce's uh, uh, lightning design system, uh, Rizzo, um, creating their own application there. And at Red Hat, we're like, you know, we're crazy. Let's just build our own. <laughs> uh, we call it Pattern Kit. Uh, and it's actually it's a, a Silex application that allows you to go to a path and it dynamically renders everything for you when you get there. And the great thing about it is it not just gives you a static template, but allows you then interact with the data. See, like, if I change, you know, that title to 20 lines of text, what does it actually look like? If I remove the title, what does it look like? So it, we needed to create something to meet our needs, and we decided to obviously roll our own. So <clears throat> the first half of, designs, of a design system's definition was a set of rules and assets. But that's only half of the definition. And I think the second part of the definition is almost just as important, if not more. Uh, a design system defines how to express everything a visual language needs to say. And again, I kind of had to cram this in here, but let me try and explain what this means. Our visual language wants to say a lot of stuff. We want to express lots of things to our user. Here is a wireframe that we were given uh, several months ago at Red Hat. Uh, lots of stuff that we wanted to express. Uh, there's news and events, features on security, resource libraries, related videos. We want to tell our user all of these things. And we need a way in a design system to be able to express those. Here's the actual design, what it turned out with our, using the visual language that we had at Red Hat. We need to figure out a way that we can build this as simply as possible with the most reusable pieces. So let's see how we would break this thing down. Ooh, yay. All right. So we've got a couple bands here. We call them bands because they're bands of content. Um, the first thing we need is we need some kind of layout, some kind of container that's going to hold these pieces. <clears throat> we decide on a band layout that basically gives us, us a header, a body, and a footer. Places we can put content that's going to give us some good spacing. Again, back to our white space and layout. Uh, but, and then the body can hold multiple different layout styles. So you could have a gallery with five items per pieces, or you can have a three-up gallery, like a 444 and a 12-column grid, or really whatever kind of layout that you want to have. And then from there, we start building components. Here's an image component. And I stress, this is an image component. This is not a logo component. This isn't an icon component or a... Um, small, whatever, <laughs> sorry. Um, this is just our image component. This is the exact same component we use anywhere in the site. If we want to have a big, huge image of something on a site, this is the exact same component that we use. The component is flexible enough. You can't really see it, but these things go, they're black and white until you hover over, over, hover, hover? Wow. over them. Our designers thought that was really cool. Something that's part of our component. That's an option you can turn on. You don't need a hover image to be able to make that work. That's just part of our component. So we see we can drop those in, and we've got all the images we need. We do the same thing with our band headers. 
Banner header is actually a set of three or four pieces of different pieces of content we can all drop in there, all with different styles, headline, title, summary, all those types of things. And we've styled those and we've basically given them an interface so you can choose whatever you want. And they can drop in and display all those headers uh, in any form fashion that we want. They actually have two different modes too, a dark theme and a light theme. So if you have a dark background, it's the same component, same markup, you're just able to switch that theme and continue on. We've got CTAs, basically do the same thing. Everywhere we need a button, we have one component, one set of markup with one set of options that allow us to do that. Or we've got a primary, secondary, disabled, all sorts of types of buttons. Again, same markup, just a couple different options within some data attributes. And lastly, all we need to finish this display is just a video embed, which again, it's a video embed. This is not a video thumbnail. This is not a, a video page thing blah, 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 blah. This is the thing we use when you click on the title and it goes to the video detail page, it's the exact same component. So we're creating these use, reusable components that allow us to express what this visual language is trying to say. So let's jump back out to this huge, huge design. Like, you know, they brought this to us in a meeting and like, this is gonna be a big job. There's lots of stuff to do here. We're like, really? Lots of stuff? Like, well, we've got that done and that's done and those are all done and that's done. And actually we had a bunch of other components done too. We saw this and kind of just laughed because we knew the work to actually get this thing done was like two stories, two small components that needed some additional functionality or just needed to be built. So as we start building out this design system, we get to a point where we realize we can express everything our visual language needs to say. Need to express something to a user? Hey, we got you know, we can do that. We have the components to build that out. See, we're not building pages anymore. We're building all of these small components that can be recombined together to create everything we need. So you do, we get to this point where we realize we have a complete design system capable of expressing everything our visual language can throw at it. And the only time we need to change that design system is if our visual language changes. If we add a new word to our vocabulary, yeah, we need to go back and figure out how to get that into the system. But until that happens, we get to a point when we're done, which is a crazy notion. We're like, wait, am I out of a job now? This sucks. Okay, let's go back to the old way. But no, instead of being out of a job, what that means is we get to now focus on making things better. Figure out how can we get better documentation, better testing, better tools, better delivery systems, better accessibility. How can we go back in the system and make it better rather than how can we build yet another page, another page, another page. I see design systems are the future of the web. And as scary as it might be, as much as you're worried about what this might do to your career, I didn't time that properly, I will not fight the future. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. That was, that was horribly timed because there's this. Really? Nobody? Come on. I forgot my... All right. So, but there's one more thing. <laughs> uh, and really, that was it, finally. Okay, so let's try this again. One more thing. All right, yeah, grown, yeah, we've all been there. So this is great and all. We've got design systems, and it's hilarious. I, you know, I wrote this thing weeks and weeks ago, uh, and I get here to DrupalCon, and this is the one more thing that always keeps coming up. And I'm happy that I can be here standing on the stage to introduce a new iPhone to you that's only going to cost $600. Fortunately, it's not an iPhone. It doesn't cost $600. It's open source. It's great. So how do we get our design system into Drupal? This is the elephant in the room. And we all have started to figure out how we can do this. But the really big question is, why haven't we already done this? Why is this not already a thing? Why didn't D8 come with like this perfect way just to do it and slap it in when we're done and we can move on? Well, I can definitely tell you why D7 didn't do it, because we spent a lot of time struggling with D7 to try and make it work with our design system. Uh, one of the main reasons for it is we've got dirty data models. We've got some really nasty data models coming from Drupal. Um, coming out of a model, our, our, title our title might be a variable, maybe. It could be something that's returned from a function. Great, cool. It might already be rendered markup with H tags and classes wrapped all around it. We never quite know what we're going to get from Drupal when we start building something. And that is very difficult to build a design system on top of. Drupal 8 solves a bit of that, gives us some really clean variables coming directly down into our templates. We know we have a set of variables and arrays and objects we can loop through and do stuff with, and life is well, it's a, little, it's a little bit better. But then we get in the notion of the tyranny of the model view paradigm. We've had this for a long time. We've got a model, set of data. We've got a view, our template file. 
That's our existence. That is our world. Anything you want to do gets done in the model and the view. They live together in perfect harmony and then we hate ourselves because we can't reuse anything because there's all these views we're constantly redoing over and over and over again for every single set of data. That's not reuse, that's not atomic, that's not going to solve our problem. What we want is we want this. We want our view to actually be composed of multiple different components. And that's what atomic design and that's what component-based design is promising us, which is great. Like, yay, let's do this. And then we realize, oh, crap. These two do not speak the same language anywhere close. And this is actually, probably, it's probably even worse than this, actually. But we see our model is saying, hey, I've got a title, I've got an image, and I've got some content. And our view is going, great, I, I need a headline. What, what, can you give me a headline instead? And uh, I, the image is great. Thank you for the image. But I need to know how to align this image, left or right. And uh, I don't really have any use for content, but I need a teaser, and I need a body section. So can you give me that instead? And sure, you could do this. You could now go back to your model and make all your models match your design. Please don't do that. We tried it. It's horrible. Because now you've got a model that specifically is built for your view. And if you ever change a template, if you want to swap a template out, do anything, you're going to completely break your model and you're going to be basically migrating every time you want to make a design change. That's not very agile. So what can we do about this? I want to introduce you to my friends. Say hello to my little friends. Uh, the presenter. The presenter is our savior in all of this. And the funny thing is, we came to this conclusion at Red Hat um, some months ago. Um, and as I started to think about it, I'm like, how does this thing work? Talked to some people at phase two, even ran into John Albin. And he's like, I've got this crazy idea. And I don't know like, if it's sane or what. Mm -hmm. We're all building presenters. And it's really kind of spooky. So let me explain to you how a presenter works. So a presenter is going to be your translator. It's going to be the middle person, this person that stands between your model, stands between your view, and says, hey, model, I know what you're doing. Hey, view, I know what you need. Let me get you both hooked up. So it looks kind of like this. Ooh, zoom in. So the, the presenter knows that I'm going to be getting a title, and it knows that I actually need a headline. So I can make that transition, make the, uh, just set the variables up, and I'll actually show a demo of this shortly. Um, and it's going to spit a headline out the other side. Image will be passed directly through, but there's an additional value that's missing from our design, this right value. Something that allows us in this design, in this view, to say specify right. Now, there's, there's a couple other options that you could, could have done. You could have just always made that view right and always make those templates right. But now you've got a right template and a left template. And you're back to just pulling your hair out. You could put all of that inside the model and say, how to let the choose. OK, to make this thing, you've got to choose left on here, or you always have to choose right. But now you're asking the user to constantly have to make those decisions. And what happens if down the road, you want to change it to left? Well, you've got to go back to the model. It's a mess. So let's do that in the presenter. We can specify that type of data right there. And lastly, we've got this content that's being passed through. And it's actually being split in our presenter. It's sent into two different places. One, just straight out as the body. But then secondly, it's passed through some kind of a filter before sending out to, uh, before being sent out to the teaser. So I'm going to dive through a quick example of kind of what that looks like in code. And don't worry, this is horrible. You can't see it. I'm going to make bigger pieces, and it's on the slides. Let's dive in. So the way this is going to look is pretty much uh, what we've been doing is using Twig to do this. Um, so you're actually writing all of your presenters right in Twig. Drupal is giving you the data. You're saying, hey, I know what to do with this data. Let's go ahead and start interfacing with some of our templates. So we include our template.twig or whatever you want to call it. And what you can see is we've got a title, uh, which is horrible on the slides, um, that's being passed in as the headline. So there you see that data conversion. The, the model thinks it's a title, but the view wants a headline. Sure, we can do that, no problem. Second thing we include is our image. So we include our image.twig, and we can use this great little um, object syntax right inside of our, uh, our include statement. And we pass the image through just as it is. That's great. It's fine. Um, and, but we also pass through one more value, which is our align right. That gets passed through, and now our presenter is passing all of that through. Um, thirdly, we want to pass through that content. So what that's going to look like is we're including our content.twig, or whatever you want to call it. Again, I probably wouldn't use these names, but it's good for the example. We're going to pass that content through twice. One's going to be passed directly through to the body. The other one is going to be passed through, the, passed through to the teaser. 
But the great thing with Twig is we have filters. We have ways to modify this data be before it's passed on to our view. And in this case, we'll use like some truncate function, or we probably also want to strip off all of the, uh, the HTML as well, so you don't you know, chop off in the middle of a P tag or something like that. But this allows us to repurpose that data to multiple places. And what we get is a full presenter, passing all this data on through. But it doesn't stop there. There's one more thing that we need to realize is we've got three different templates here. And these three templates, what, just going to sit in the middle of our DOM? Probably not. There's probably going to be some kind of a wrapper around this. So like in this case, maybe we want to put like a card around it. Well, we have two options. We could just take our little twig file that has all those includes and card, sweet, we're done, moving on. Problem with that is the presenter paradigm doesn't really work that way. And I completely actually missed talking about this. Um, this presenter paradigm is actually within something larger called model view presenter. Very kind of uh, similar to the MVC paradigm. Uh, MVP, model view presenter, is something that's actually been around since mid 90s. I'm reading like articles from 1995 talking about using MVP to create interfaces within Windows 95. Like this is a paradigm that's been used for decades and decades to create interfaces. Totally missed it. I'm oh, sorry. Um, but part of that paradigm says that the presenter's job is just to be a presenter. It is not there to actually be the view. It has no, no, has no opinion about the actual market that gets placed out. So what we want to do is we want to make sure we keep that presenter pure. We don't want to get markup in there. So what we can do is we can use extends. It's another great thing, extend or embed if you've got multiple of these, to, to be able to find what, is, what are these wrappers that we're going to use to, to, to put all these includes inside of. And Twig makes that super easy, which is why I was like, let's just do this in Twig, where we've got our card that's got um, a block inside of it. And when we extend card, we can just put all of our content right inside that block. And again, you can't see it too great, but here's my fancy laser pointer. We have extend up top and down below, and we've got our block body with our three includes inside of it. That is our presenter. That is what we came up with. That is what Bloom here and crew came up with. That is exactly what John Albin did. He's like, is this crazy? But no, we've all come to the same conclusion. This is basically the, the interface that allows us to use a design system while still using Twig and still interfacing with our Drupal model. And it is going to blow the doors off the way that we're building all of our tools. Because at that point, it really doesn't matter the tool we use, whether it's Pattern Lab, whether it's Pattern Kit, whether it's KSS or whatever. The methodology is the same. We're creating views. We're creating models and we're creating presenters in between. So one other great thing about this is that now that we have a model, now we have a defined model and we have the system for turning our model into a view, why don't we get a little fancy? Why don't we start talking about the API of this model? How can we describe to Drupal what this data needs to look like? And we can do that with this great little syntax called JSON schema. Um, and the way that we do that is with, uh, um, it's, all, it's all written in, JS in JSON. Um, so you've got little objects and, and uh, properties and values. Um, and we can say, since this is an object, we've got three values here. We know there's going to be three key value pairs going on. We can say that it's an object. I'll use that again. And it's going to have some properties inside. Uh, first property is going to be that it's the title. And we're going to say, hey, this title's a string. Cool. That's really informative. We have an image. In this case, it's just a string. It's a path to our image. We can make it more complex if we want to. But lastly, we've got content which is a string, but format of HTML, a little bit more information about what this property actually is and how it should be used and how it should be displayed and how it should be treated. Um, and you can also dive into, we have arrays and we have Booleans, we have all sorts of different uh, uh, content types to be able to describe what this data is that needs to be passed into our presenter. We realized this and I was like, cool, we've got a great way to be able to document how we need our data uh, built to be able to pass it into our templates. JSON schema is completely open standard. There's lots of great tools built around JSON schemas. Um, one of them that's really cool turns your JSON schema into a form using JavaScript. I was like, oh, that's kind of neat. JSON schema is pretty much the data I need, so it can create a form that supplies that data. I thought to myself, well, if we can create a form out of JavaScript using these schemas, why can't we do the exact same thing with Drupal? Why can't we tell Drupal, go create a new entity for me and, the, oh, click. There we go. Thank you. All right. Um, go create a new entity for me and use this schema as your, uh, as your recipe. It's got an, a title. It's got an image. It's got content. Oh, that's why I didn't go. I forgot one thing. You can also specify what's required, like what are the required elements in there and what's not required. That's why one click didn't do it. So when we pull this into Drupal, Drupal now understands this is our data model that needs to be sent to our presenter. 
These are the fields. These are the names of the fields that we're expecting to come in. These are the data types. These are even the formats of how we should display those and how we should store those. And that is the, uh, that is the kind of the realization, the epiphany that led us to building Pattern Builder. And I'm not going to dive into this too much because I'm doing a boff right after this. And I'll get that on the slide. But Pattern Builder is a new Drupal 7 module. We hope for a, D7, for a D8 port. We just haven't built it yet because we're still D7. But what it does, it allows you to prototype your entire design system. I, uh, Pattern Lab is awesome. It allows you to design kind of the view layer of your, of your application, but does nothing for your presenter and your model. Uh, within Pattern Builder, we can build the entire thing and prototype the entire thing. Um, and then when we're done, sorry, with using JSON schemas and Twig templates, um, which basically means we've got these really non drupal -y things. We've got schemas and templates that really we could use anywhere in D7 and D8, WordPress site, crazy ideas. But in D7, what we're able to do with Pattern Builder is then take all those schemas and create, we're using paragraph modules specifically, create a bunch of paragraph entities uh, automatically with a single drush command. So our entire data model for every single view that we have in all of our design system with a single import drush command, we build all of our, uh, all of our paragraph entities out of that. That means that you can then uh, create a paragraph bundle for each model, thank you, and then allows you to go and create content types using all of these paragraphs. These paragraphs that have the data model defined by Twig or by JSON schemas, they're all then rendered directly through those Twig files. We're basically saying Drupal render engine, no thank you, you're a little bit messy, we're going to go directly to just a PHP install of Twig right on your server. Render that template, bring it right back to us, cache it, do whatever you need Drupal, but that's the way that we're going to roll. And as I was saying, it renders that model back through a clean, uh, uh, clean model through our, our Twig templates. So as I said, prototyping our entire MVP, every single view, every single display, everything we need uh, defined in not just what it looks like. Yeah, thanks. I know. I know. I've got a timer right here. I, it's like the last slide. What are you talking about? I'm good. All right. <laughs> um, uh, imported the entire thing with a drush command. It t usually took us six weeks to take a pattern bring it through the entire process of creating, uh, um, creating the story, creating the, the acceptance criteria, uh, create, like defining what we need built. Three weeks of that, three weeks of development time, six weeks to develop one feature so someone could go in and enter three fields and get something displayed out. We've now turned that into a Drush command, something that can be done on deploy. So, and changes, if we need to make changes to these, again, we make changes in the design system, do a release, that gets to sent out with the next deployment. It's changed the way we build things. It's now open source on D.O, on GitHub, with some surrounding tools. Um, and I am going to talk about that in room 291 right after this. So um, that is a thank you after I say also go to Wireframes to Widgets, which is tomorrow at, you didn't put the time on the slide. 2.15. Well, they're actually going to be talking about uh, how they're using um, Pattern Lab, how they're doing presenters, how they're bringing Pattern Lab into D8. And with that, and paragraphs, yes. And with that, I'm definitely done. <laughs> now we have about four-ish minutes. So um, if you have any questions, uh, I'd be happy to take one or two. But again, I'm going to be down in, um, where is it? 291? Oh, come on. Too far. 291. <laughs> Uh, basically answering questions and giving some demos of this. Anyone dying for a question or can wait? We're good? Awesome. Thanks.